What's up guys, I'm Matt Gary, and in this 13th episode of the Separation of Concerns and Apex Common Tutorial Series, we're going to go over the selector layer in Salesforce. Alright, so welcome to the 13th episode of this Separation of Concerns and Apex Common Tutorial Series. And in this episode, we are going to go over the selector layer, what it is, when you should create one, why you should use one, all that kind of wonderful stuff, along with your options for frameworks that at least I think are decent to implement, um, you know, the selector layer with. So what is the selector layer? The selector layer is something that's... Um, I guess kind of unique to, to Salesforce. It's it's unique in that it's different than other tech stacks because of the way that Salesforce handled things. So no, normally this would be called, I think, um, like the uh, data mapper layer, something along those lines if you're in a typical tech stack. But because of the way that Salesforce handles objects uh, for or handles the way that we are able to query for objects, it's a little different. And in Salesforce, we call it the selector layer. I'm not going to get into the differences. It's not super important, but that just know that because of the way that we're able to like query in line for things and deal with stuff and it being quite a bit different than other tech stacks, we call it the selector layer instead of a data mapper layer, which is what you would normally hear this called or or referred to as. So um, the selector layer is basically literally for selecting records. Uh, it's for your queries that you would do to your um, <clears throat> to your objects in, in Salesforce, right? It's a place to, to house all of that information. Now, the question is, I think that m the most people have is, why? Why, Matt? <laughs> why would you choose to make a selector layer? What's the point in that? Well, if you think about it, if you really think about it, you probably have hundreds, and if your org is big enough, maybe thousands of queries in your your Salesforce org. There are two reasons that it's beneficial to place all this all those queries into object specific selector classes. Um, the first one is uh, it's going to assist you greatly when it comes to unit tests. It's going to it's going to help a whole bunch <laughs> uh, if you want to do uh, mocking for unit tests, which we'll go over that in episodes 15, 16, and 17. So bear with me and we'll, we'll get more into that later. But if you're querying in line everywhere and you're not using a selector, basically what I can tell you is you're going to, you're going to miss out on a lot of the, the speed benefits anyway of unit testing, along with some other things. Um, but there's one unit test. The second one, which is which is uh, very important, is that you get a lot of consistency in your queries. Right? Um, it's very possible that you need all of these fields, for instance, to really be queried for on every um, ninety-nine percent of your your queries for the case object. So this, what I'm showing you in front of me is a, an example of a case selector using the Apex Common library, which we'll go over this more in the next episode. But you, basically what you'll get is a lot more consistency in your queries, not to mention you'll get a place where all of these queries are stored, so you always know where to go to like update your queries if you need to update them, right? You don't have to like think about it. So Let's go over both of those things really quick. Consistency. You can get consistency in the fields that get returned to you. You know, with this selector, every single query that I do, I'm going to get these fields returned to me. Uh, you can get consistency in your ordering. So, for instance, if I wanted uh, all of my queries, or the vast majority anyway, of my queries to be ordered in a specific way, 
I can set the default ordering to order by name, order by created date, order by whatever. So I know that my results get returned to me in a very specific way. Um, so you're going to gain a lot of like query consistency by using a selector layer if you use it the way that it should be used. Um, and then the second piece of this, which I guess really there's three things, not two, but the second part of this is you get to house all of your object specific queries in one place, right? So I know that if there's all of a sudden a problem with one of my case queries, I can come right back here to this case selector and update that case query, right? I know where it lives. Um, it's entirely possible. In fact, in my experience, it's more than entirely possible <laughs> that you have the exact same query 15 places in your system. You're querying for cases 10 different times in 10 different scenarios. Well, in the event that you need that query to change uh, in a uniform way for all those 10 different places, you would have to go to all 10 places and update that query, right? So two things there. Number one, uh, you've by using a selector layer for those uh, queries, right, you've now significantly reduced your code. You only have to write that query in one place instead of 10 places. And you've simplified your updates to that, making it much easier to deal with in the future. If all of a sudden that query needs a couple of new fields added to it, or it needs to be filtered by a new thing, um, you can just go to that one place in your code, fix that one query, and then everywhere will be good to go. So it makes managing, you know, your queries considerably simpler. Um, and you might be in a small org now and you might think, mm, no big deal, but if you really do have plans to grow, this will eventually, um, you'll eventually see that this has an, an extremely huge benefit to your org in the, the long run there. Um, all right, so as far as when you should create a selector, uh, you're basically going to create a selector class anytime that you need to do a SQL query or a social query or an aggregate query um, on an object right as soon as you need to do that on uh, just a single query on any of your objects you would create a new selector class so you have a selector class for each object in your system that you're querying on that's basically when you create a selector um yeah i think that's that's covering most of the things an important piece about the selector class uh, it's the same kind of thing in the domain class I hope I went over it in the domain video. I'm not sure I did. But selector classes and domain classes should always use inherited sharing. The reason that they should use inherited sharing is because we don't really like want them to control the sharing. We want the calling classes to control the sharing that they should should um, have. So if for some reason you were just calling your case selector uh, well, it's really never going to happen. It could happen for the domain layer, but inherited sharing by default is really with sharing, right? So if you were just messing with this class and this class wasn't being called from any anywhere specifically, this will run as with sharing. If you were calling this from a class that had without sharing um, declared, then inherited sharing would basically end up as without sharing. So these should really run in the context of the calling class ideally um, yeah I think those are, are those, those are really the, the major things uh, if you check out the wiki there's a couple other things that I go over like my suggested naming convention for selector classes which is just um, account selector method signatures basically that they should be uh, bulkified. You should have bulkified method signatures for your um, different selector methods. 
uh, or the different methods in your selector class also that you should call them or start them with select right select by account ID select by ID select by last modified date so that you know that you're selecting or querying now these are just my suggestions some of them stem from um, suggestions that have been passed on to me some of them are my own like I personally like to put underscore selector some people don't so much um, these are just personal opinions you are welcome to define your own personal opinions for these if you, if you have different ideas um, the only other thing that I'll go over is that there are only really two libraries for this that I could find uh, in my many many hours investigating these uh, you know how, how to implement a good selector layer um, there are only two libraries that I would say are worth your time to look at um, there's the apex common library which of course we're gonna go over in the next video and there's the query dot apex library which is also pretty great now the difference between these two right the the core difference and the reason that I I guess um, I've decided I'm gonna push apex common a little bit more is that you've got query.apex right and it is a great tool dude don't get me wrong at all uh, it is pretty great but query.apex is literally just for a selector layer that's it right it's it's built for selecting and that's great and it does do a wonderful job um, but the apex common library is in my opinion equally great uh, there are some differences between the two some things query.apex supports that uh, apex common doesn't like inherently give you but for the most part they're pretty similar and apex common contains all of the frameworks for all of the layers that it can right so say I was using query.apex that's great but now I have to find something for my domain layer I would have to pick out a new trigger handler class and I'd have to hope that that trigger handler class has good support in a dedicated author that's going to keep it updated and dedicate a community um, and then the other thing is okay you know maybe I want frameworks for a unit of work right great apex common already has unit of work in here query.apex doesn't but I guess what I'm saying is then you have to go find a third library to do that unit of work stuff so if you want to if you want to do all these things you have to mesh together all these libraries and all these libraries you have to hope one of two things um, one that you have enough time personally to upkeep them if you need new things or something's broken or whatever else or two that the author in the community of these different libraries has time to upkeep them when all the new features of Salesforce come out and things get deprecated whatever right so that is one thing that you do not have to worry about with apex common <laughs> you can see there's an enormous amount of people that are invested in this library this is huge for the Salesforce community 542 people and a huge number of contributors right 36 is pretty huge for for Salesforce um, you won't you won't find that level of contribution on anything else um, query.apex does have better support than I would say the majority of places but uh, anyway those are my thoughts on these libraries and these are my thoughts on why apex common is in my opinion about as good as you could ever ask for um, I keep saying it I didn't think I was gonna push this library as much as I'm ending up pushing it in this series but it's uh, really well built it's got great support and I hope that with this tutorial series it'll make it easier for a lot more people to to I guess start leveraging because right, honestly we're very lucky it exists <laughs> um, all right that's it that's it that's enough of that rant next uh, video we're gonna go over how to implement the selector layer using the apex common library so um, yeah stick with me and uh, we'll uh, figure this out together. <laughs> All right, I'll see you next time.